right. Thank you, everybody, for joining this afternoon or morning, depending on where you're at. I um, wanted to welcome our next session speakers. We have Lori Warnock, a fan representative of New Hampshire, Anna Sasa, EMS State Partnership Program Manager of New Hampshire, Victoria Barnes, Project Manager for EIC State Partnerships, and Sandra Nashka, Florida EMSC fan representative. Okay. So this is Lori. I am going to attempt to share my screen. And let's see if we can do this by going to, hello. <laughs> we got your desktop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's already have you up. Let's go like that. Let's go yes. like, yeah, there we go. We're getting so close. I was told there'd be no technology. All right, there we go. How's that? Okay. Can everybody see the role of Family Advisory Network representatives? Yes. Fabulous. And there's a question already in the chat. Okay, fine. I know that's it. All right. No Here we go. Food. All right. So let's advance. All right. Um, so um, some of this is a bit of a recap from what we've already talked about in the sense that we're talking about the general roles of the family advisory network, right? It, it's being an advocate and that can be on several levels. That can be, you most, many of us are familiar with being an advocate on behalf of our child um, or in on as a representative of our agency. Um, but for EMSC purposes, we often have to take that broader look uh, beyond our own personal experience and be talking about the sort of, um, whether it's the grants particular focus, whether it's the legislation's particular focus, it's that broader look. But what we really bring to the table so effectively is the story. Because for many of us, our, our experience with EMS, our personal experiences with EMS are what put a face and a heart on what we do. And that's what brings people in because talking about policy statements, um, you know, especially when we're talking about inter, inter hospital transport and blah, 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 blah. I don't think anybody who listened to Melissa talk about her experience at parenting a child that she could not get access to during COVID and the, the terrible consequences that had of her not being able to advocate for him yesterday. I don't think there's a person who could hear that story and not feel that, oh my God, we have got to do something to fix that. And that's where we really bring, where we really bring it. Sandy, why don't you talk about this one? Okay, so your role on the state advisory board is to serve as the family representative. We all know that. Your specialty is bringing the reality of the day-to-day -day issues of caring for children when you go to these meetings. That is your specialty, especially if you are the parent of children with special health care needs or those that might care for them in an emergency. We are bringing um, our experiences with the EMS uh, system to reality in the groups that we're in. And we do have a voice that is able to give them that information on why we need to do what we're doing. Uh, we can help with special pro projects as little or as much as you wish what we went through the last time. It may be an area of particular interest for you or a focused need within the grant. Um, I'm working on um, a few in my state now. One has to do with disaster planning and the other has to do with infant mortality. So those are two of my soapboxes and they allow me to work on those with them. Help with grant writing if asked, especially if you have experience. Now, personally, I hate writing grants. I'll do them if I am forced to, but it is just not within me to enjoy doing it. And yet you have those people that live to do these grants. God bless them. That's all I can say. Attend meetings in either person or virtual. This is our first year doing a virtual meeting, and I think it's gone pretty well. And then attend the grantee meeting 
well, it's not, I don't think it's going to be annually now. I think it's going to be every two years. Your participation is included as part of your grant requirements to be a fan. Um, these meetings in person are great. You get to meet the other people you've been talking to online. We do have a lot of fun at these and we learn a lot. So I would recommend if once we get a date for the next one, you clear your calendar so that uh, you are able to attend this because it really is a good good thing to go to. You make That's how Lori and I became friends was uh, attending these meetings. And so we have both made lots of friends within this group and uh, you can talk to them about what they're doing. You can get, give them ideas of what you're doing in your state. It's a great transition of information and um, you can take that back to your own group. We have had parents who've attended with their child because mm -hmm. they either did not have respite care available or um, once they came to the grantee meeting, um, some respite care was provided for them so that they could also have you know, some some free time within uh, the grantee conference. So um, for a parent that says, yeah, that would be lovely. I'd love to come to DC, but it's just not as doable. Certainly a virtual event like this lends itself and I can only foresee us taking advantage of the technology in the future going, uh, going forward. But we have had parents attend with their children. And they also bring their story when you meet. Absolutely. So connecting with other stakeholders, um, you know, in your state, you may be familiar with family voices. Um, you may be familiar with uh, the Katie Beckett agency that, um, or, or whatever, uh, Bureau of Special Medical Services, the different agencies that work to support families of kids with special needs. Um, or you may work within the EMS agencies. Um, when we created our curriculum on children with special health care needs back in the late 90s, one of the comments that we got from uh, parents that were on our advisory board was, look, I can suction my kid fine. I can suction their trach just fine, but I can't do that and drive the family minivan all the way to children's hospital. So sometimes what I need a paramedic with the big scrambled eggs on his uniform, you know, and, and the, the attitude that steps back, I'm a paragod, I need him to drive, just get out of my way. And that was enlightening for a lot of the EMS providers because of course, they're used to stepping on scene and being the medical expert. Step back, ladies and gentlemen, I can take care of this. And when they see your child and all the technology and bells and whistles that you have in your home setup, suddenly uh, it's a gulp moment for them. And many paramedics or many EMS providers don't realize the extent to which adults and children with special health care needs are living in their communities with the support of durable medical equipment mm -hmm. um, that they aren't expecting to find. So your uh, familiarity with that process, your familiarity with those systems. I, I'd say if you were a parent, if you were a person who worked for a DME company, that would be a, a, another great voice to have as a, a fan because your interaction with families and the hurdles they often have to jump through with insurance, for example, um, in order to get the equipment that their children need. Uh, I think that would be a great resource. Certainly helping to develop programs by providing insights, representing um, the state at EMSC related meetings, whether it's regional meetings, whether it's, as we talked about, uh, representing on things like safe kids or injury prevention councils or suicide prevention councils, any of those um, uh, sort of subcultures that are out there. Um, and then whether it's the legislative activity, the protocol development, we've already talked about a little bit. Sandra, this one is yours, babe. Oh, okay. Um, there are people that enjoy going and talking with the legislators on what, why EMSC is so important. And sometimes having the voice of a parent who can explain like Melissa's story kind of helps get attention and they will listen to them. It might not be the person you're coming to talk to, but someone will be there. And we have fans that love doing that. And God bless them too, because I'm that isn't me. But if forced to, I would do it. But um, we do have those people, and they're like, "Yeah, pick me. I'm going to go, and I'm going to do it." And I say, "Bless you. I think that's wonderful." Um, 
network and collaborate with other fans in your state, well, we already know that I don't have any more in my state, but if you have more than one in your state, talk with them, get together and um, see what's going on and how you can all work together to cover the entire state with whatever is happening with that. Um, be non-political voice for children. We're not here to get involved in the politics of it. We're here to take care of, of our kids. And again, tell your story. What motivated you to do this? Your experience count. My motivation other than Dr. Henry asking me was because I had a child with, I have a child with um, cerebral palsy and going through the surgeries and the the casting and the serial casting that we had to do and all of that we've used the system and so bringing that voice on how it's it was well done or it wasn't well done can often get you the attention that you need understand that this is not for your personal or professional gain it's solely to meet your child's need. A lot of our fans have uh, groups that they've developed or ideas that they've developed and they want things done a certain way, but we're here for all children, not for just some children. So you've got to remember that. That doesn't belittle the organization that you've begun or the, or, or the ideas that you've had. What it is, is we're looking out for all children, not Republican or Democrat, but C for the children. And I love that, Lori, you added that. Thank you. One uh, uh, previous meetings, uh, grantee meetings in DC, we've actually had the opportunity to meet with some of our legislators. Mm -hmm. We've set up some field trips uh, in the course of the conference for um, uh, especially um, for those agencies that come from the really big states where they don't have the opportunity to meet with their legislator very often. Um, you know, Texas, I know they their legislation, the legislature only meets uh, six months every two years. So, you know, each state has their own sort of quirks. And when we talk about network and collaborating, um, it isn't just with your state. Sometimes there are regional collaboratives. For a while, we had a New England regional collaborative. In fact, we had regional EMSC meetings instead of all grantee meetings. And that's a, a nice chance to work with the groups in your region. You may also want to look for grants that are doing a program similar to yours in nature, even if they're not geographically close, because then you can talk with them about what they're able to accomplish, how their fans are supporting the mission of the, the grant topic, the grant purpose, and um, th that can lead to some good brainstorming too. So what are the kinds of talents? Well, we look for public speaking, education, public policy background, you know, anytime, um, whatever you can do to promote the social media for your agency. I'm a Facebook junkie. I'm on Facebook all the time. So I'm often sharing the all the posts from the different um, agencies that I do volunteer work for. I'm very active in the YWCA and domestic and sexual violence issues. And they have a lot of LGBTQ type activities for youth. I'm always sharing those. We share the EMSC stuff. I share poison stuff all the time. You know, you are a, an additional um, venue for disseminating information. Um, and then certainly honing your, your public speaking skills, she says, stumbling. Um, you know, <laughs> work, working on your capacity to um, directly focus a piece of legislation, your comments on a piece of legislation as to why it would either benefit the children in your community, how it reflects your personal experience and it, how that impacts the broader sense of policy. All of those things are assets that you can bring. So what's going on in your state right now or nationally, like in Florida, we are the epicenter for the COVID-19 Delta variant. We're seeing more children with COVID now. How do we stop that? Oh, I don't know. Hospitals are over maximum capacity. And when I wrote this, we had two tropical events coming in the next 10 days. That's just in my state. Uh, what's new in your neck of the woods? Let us know what's going on. If we've got similar things, we can talk. We can exchange information. Uh, everybody's got COVID and I think what bothers me because of what we're going through is how many kids are getting it now that are under the age that cannot be vaccinated and how do we protect them? So uh, that's what's happening just in the Southeast. 
what's happening where you're at and look and see where you or your EMSC can make some strides in helping what's going on. In our area, for example, uh, we are facing a huge uptick in vaping and electronic cigarette use among teens as young as middle schoolers. And we're also, as everyone knows, we, we, had, we were sort of the leading edge of the opioid epidemic. And while um, opioids were not per se as much of an issue among children, um, as Mark talked about yesterday, the mental health issues that we see among kids whose parents have overdosed, who have witnessed overdose, who have lost parents or siblings due to overdose has led to the development of things like ACERT teams, adverse childhood experience response teams that will um, follow up when a child has either witnessed domestic or sexual violence or has witnessed an overdose, has witnessed some kind of violent activity, they'll go in and do an assessment, a multidisciplinary team that goes in to do an assessment for that child to see what kinds of services or interventions might help um, minimize the long-term effects of that adverse childhood experience. But clearly our small environment and what we're dealing with in New Hampshire is gonna be vastly different with someone in California, for example, is dealing with. And even within California, because it's such a big state, the different issues that are coming up. So, you know, you you have that, that capacity to bring that forward to the EMSC program as well. You know, we used to do what we call targeted issues grants, where we could focus on a specific issue. They were less policy oriented and more, say, educational oriented. And we may see a swing back toward that. Um, I don't know, Anna, do you want to talk about this one a little bit? You know, the PEDS Ready and the disaster training and that sort of thing? Absolutely. Um, and then I don't know what the where the slides take us from here, but we can then transition into what the program manager position looks like. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so in New Hampshire, we have Lori and I also have a second uh, fan uh, named Eric, and um, they've been great at just sort of supplementing their own interests, but also what are needed for the program. Um, so pr promoting pediatric concerns, um, PEDS Ready is um, the National Pediatric Readiness Project um, is the assessment that we closed out yesterday. So that's um, interfacing with hospitals to um, uh, increase buy-in and participation in that readiness assessment um, and doing disaster training. And it, it works out well. Um, my other uh, fan works at a um, not only at a, an emergency department, but he also works pre-hospitally as well and does a lot of training. Um, and then having uh, your, sorry, my dog's in my space. Um, having the fan act as a family voice um, in emergency care preparedness and response. So um, as a program manager, I didn't have any um, children until a few years ago. So Lori and Eric both acted as um, uh, family representatives because they did have a family and that was greatly helpful for me. Um, and of course, who better to fight and prove for, for our care for our kids other than people who have their own kids? Because um, now that I do have my own kids, it, it takes on a whole new meaning of, um, you know, being able to provide the best emergency care for all kids. But now that I can relate to that with my own children, um, you know, it, it really creates that understanding of the needs, um, especially um, for children with uh, special health care needs or um, uh, technology dependence. Um, and then uh, I'm lucky enough to have Lori, who is clearly a, um, a, a dainty uh, flower who doesn't like to speak out. This is, of course, being sarcastic. Um, if you haven't met Lori, she's wonderful. She gets, per she gets uh, involved in not only state issues, but um, national committees. You see her here uh, presenting on behalf of the FAN Network. Um, and so if they have the time and the interest... Um, all of our um, programs were required that we write in for funding for them to travel and my other fan has um, joined in previous uh, all grantee meetings. So getting them involved in um, in person um, experiences like this and also in person meetings when we get back to that, which would be fantastic. Um, so I just urge all state managers. Um, and well, state managers reach out to your fans to see where they and what they want to do to help and then what their capacity is as well. So you can um, work together to figure out what the best role is for your, for your fan. Next slide. Okay, so at, at this point, um, uh, Vicki and I are gonna talk about the state partnership role um, and we don't have any slides um, 
to uh, present to you here. Um, I think what we'll do is talk about what our experience has been as a state partnership program manager. Um, and so I'll talk about my experience and then hand it off to Vicki. Yeah, she is still here. And then um, we'll just open it up to see maybe what um, new program managers thought would be their role and how it's different or things that they um, are hoping to do that maybe they haven't heard other program managers talk about, um, you know, sort of send out your feelers to see what would be appropriate things as a program manager or answer your questions. So I've been in the role in New Hampshire for just over four years. Um, and anybody who's new here, you're gonna feel overwhelmed. It's totally normal. My very first day as program manager, I hopped a flight to DC and came to this meeting in person. Um, I was the newest program manager. I was on day two and um, I, I'm still, still amazed that the support was there when I arrived in person. I got a hug from Jocelyn. Um, you know, people were all reaching out to me and offering me support. And so now as I guess one of the senior program managers, I'm doing the same to you. So I'm going to drop my email uh, in this in the chat box so that if anybody has any questions, you are more than welcome to reach out to me. Um, I'd be happy to help and support y'all um, in your role. So there it is. Um, so I had received the program from uh, my predecessor who had started the New Hampshire EMS for Children program in like 1994. And she had been in the role of program manager for about 25 years, which was really overwhelming. And then to add on to that, um, there was about eight or nine months where there was nobody in the program manager role. So the advisory committee had fallen apart. Um, the performance measures had just been released. Um, so there was all this new stuff that my predecessor couldn't tell me anything about. And I had heard great things about her, but I'd also heard some not so great things about her. So learning how to navigate all of the hats, and you're going to hear that so many times, how many hats you wear was really um, it was daunting. And again, with all the support that I received from other program managers, it became, as each year goes by, it becomes uh, easier and easier to kind of accept what is happening. And, and things are constantly going to change. Um, some of you may work in EMS, so you know that protocols are constantly evolving. Um, and it's no different here. As we, as we reach goals, we need to find new goals to um, avoid that ceiling effect of, you know, everybody reaching perfection, because there's always improvement to be done. Um, so I came into the role um, really kind of knowing that there was this thing called NEDARC and the EISC was just becoming a thing um, and showed up at this meeting with hundreds of people that I didn't know, but everybody was super warm and welcoming um, and started learning about the performance measures, um, which really are, I'd say, like the guiding ship as to what we try to do. And they're, you know, quantifiable and there's a certain date, now we call them SMART goals, a certain date that you need to reach them by. And this really kind of is, um, I think the, the framework and structure of the program management role is, is working on those. Um, now, I think what you'll find as the time goes by is you get involved in things like um, car seats with kids, both in personal vehicles and ambulances. You'll get involved in injury prevention. You'll get involved in public outreach. And really, the, the, while we have these performance measures that you need to focus on um, to really meet those data-based goals or evidence-based goals, um, you'll be involved in so many things that is state-specific. Um, so we have a section of New Hampshire that's called the North Country, and it's the very northernmost it's like the, the top third of the state is uh, really wouldn't even be considered rural. It's like frontier. It's, it's the most rural. There are no paid or even mixed EMS systems up there. Everything is volunteer. Transport times are hours on end. Um, the winter weather is absolutely awful. So um, with all of these things combined, sorry, I'm going up on a tangent. With all these things combined, New Hampshire has um, become um, really um, driven to work with the North Country because they really are where the resources are the most minimal. Um, and it sounds like everybody in the states and probably most of the associated territories has that rural area that they um, are aware, you know, need, needs extra support. Um, so what you'll find as you, as you spend time in the program management role or the FAN uh, role, you'll learn certain um, features of your state that's specific to your state and then um, be able to start thinking of ideas um, on how to accommodate and how to make your state partnership program more um, customized for your state. 
Um, so grant writing happens. Um, well, the 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 um, it's known as the competing grant. It's every four years. Um, we've had an extension this year, so we're going to be going actually into grant year five next year. Um, but every four years, we write a large grant. It's usually about eighty pages long. It takes takes me probably two months of prep work. You've got to get letters of support and um, write what your plans are for the next four years. Again, I had just gotten into this role and within two months had to write an 80 page grant for a program that I had just been introduced to. So it can be very overwhelming, but I, you'll hear me say this over and over again. There's so much support out there for, um, for the new program managers and the new fans. Um, and then we have uh, federal reports. We have performance measure, uh, performance, re performance um, reports, performance reports, um, and then also check-ins during the summer as well. So we do um, usually two smaller federal reports per year. Um, we have these in-person, eventually in-person meetings, um, usually once a year or, twice, or once every other year. Um, we'll be doing uh, data collection in the early spring. So end of winter, spring, we do the pre-hospital uh, data collection. And then in the early summer, so May to July, as we, you've seen, we use the, um, uh, the hospital assessments during that time to collect more data. And then all of that gets fed back to um, HRSA so that we can see how we're doing on those performance measures. Um, before I hand it over to Vicki, um, I realize I've dumped a whole bunch of information on y'all. Does anybody have any questions? Feel free to unmute or write in the chat box. Can I get somebody uh, to just let me know that you can hear me and are receiving my questions? We can hear you. Yes. Awesome. Thank you, David. I think you underestimate yourself. You hit the ground running pretty fast. Yeah, I'm good at that, right, Lori? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I too am a, a dainty flower. All right, Vicki, why don't you explain your experience in Connecticut and then we can come back and see if we can get more participation and questions. Okay, great. Thanks, Anna. And Anna is definitely a rock star. So we really appreciate her. Um, you know, we, I started as the program coordinator, we call it here in Connecticut. Um, and that was about four years ago, um, before I took the role with the EIIC. So we've done a lot of New England regional projects together, Anna and I, and we have a really nice uh, tighten the group here. So that's something you can always consider as well as teaming up with other states, getting little groups together. Um, you know, whether it's based on geography or based on interest. Um, and that's something that I sort of helped coordinate and push out as part of my role with the EIIC. But um, sort of similar to Anna, when I came in, um, our, the position of program coordinator had been vacant for quite some time. Uh, so there was nobody to orient me, nobody to to teach me, um, I know, get out your violins, but um, you know, we figured out a way around a lot of that stuff. I was very lucky in that um, having been an EMT in the past, there were actually still a lot of people around who I had crossed paths with over the years and worked with. Um, and I'm also a nurse, so I have the inpatient and uh, ED experience. So, um, and one of the other things with our program is it had sat at different um, areas in the state since it began. So it was sat at the state level, it sat at a children's hospital level, and it finally came to um, where I'm employed, which is Yale New Haven Children's Hospital. So, um, you know, through the grapevine, we had heard that, you know, EMSC wasn't too active in Connecticut. People really didn't understand who we were. Some people and uh, had a bad taste in their mouth about it. I never really figured out what that was about, but um, like Anna, you know, relationship building has really been the most important thing I think I did in the role. Um, we were really able to forge a lot of new relationships with um, our hospital association in the state, with our um, hospital preparedness program and our healthcare coalition, um, different folks in EMS, hospital, disaster, um, and I can't speak enough to that. Um, one of the problems is, is that a lot of these mandates and the performance measures that we try to get out there, they're unfunded. Um, a lot of towns and cities are in financial straits. Um, you know, some, 
some are even to the point of going bankrupt. And when we come in and say, oh, well, we need you to train all your guys and gals on um, pediatric skills twice a year. And if they so happen to be a town that has a union, that brings in a whole lot of problems as well. So um, one thing I always suggest is, you know, tread kind of lightly. Our work is very important. We want to get it out there, but you also don't want to rub people the wrong way or, or make any enemies. Um, and now with the addition of Jen Talley to the EIIC team, she's been with us a little over a year now. Um, she has taken um, the fan program, you know, under her guise and uh, really her and I hope to work together. We would really like to team up fans and state partnerships. New Hampshire has a great working relationship. Um, we do here in Connecticut as well with Nancy Labogo and Jen Groves Fusco, but you know, there's a lot of states where there's a bit of a disconnect there. Um, and, you know, relatively speaking, Anna and I are from very small states. So I truly feel for the Californias and the Texases and the Alaskas and all these huge states who are given the same exact amount of money that we are in a small state, but expected to cover. Um, you know, we can get in our cars and drive around. That, that's not the same for every state. So we really want to be able to pair the fan and the state partnership role together. Um, we would like to see the Fans take on more of a role with the performance measures. Those are something that we need to meet. That's Congress mandated. So, you know, as much as, you know, meeting those percentages, um, you know, on a yearly stepwise fashion can be difficult, it is something that HRSA needs to report back to Congress on. And that's, you know, ultimately how we get our funding. Um, but, you know, I'd say keep going, keep working, do what you can. This is definitely a marathon, it's not a sprint. Um, do little projects at a time, try to stay organized. That's sort of where I tend to fall short. I try to do a whole lot of stuff at once. And then I, you know, don't necessarily always complete each thing I want to do. And then when you're going back and looking things up, you're just like chasing your tail looking for things. So try to take the time to get organized first, get your strategy developed, come up with a game plan, um, and then really execute that. Um, you know, there's nothing that we can do wrong here. Anything that we do is going to be good. Um, so just keep at it. Um, do we have any brand new fans that are on the um, session today that wouldn't mind speaking up? If no one speaks up, I will totally call people out. <laughs> <laughs> or for that matter, new state partnership managers. I know Ben is on from Massachusetts. He's brand spanking new like you, Anna. I think he just started last week or the week before, Ben. <laughs> two weeks in. Oh, two weeks. Oh, you're an old pro. You're a, you're a veteran now. <laughs> but did you have any questions? Is there anything you are just finding totally overwhelming at the moment? Um, and have you met your fan yet, for that matter? I have not met my fan, but I am mostly in sponge mode right now, just trying to take in everything. Okay, I'm waving to you, Ben. And there's Liz. We're on. Oh, hello. Hi. Nice to meet you. Good to meet hey, you ben. too. Oh, good. I'm glad you guys had a chance to to meet virtually at least. And I'm sure that'll be in, you know, in person as soon as we can. I know there's still a lot of travel restrictions depending on whether you work for a hospital or a state. So um I'm sure that you guys will be meeting regularly going forward and getting Ben up to speed on what's happening and hearing Ben's ideas too. So, and that's what this is all about. We want it to be, you know, that all teach, all learn, bi-directional type of thing, so. Is there um, anybody here within their first month of program man management or fan role? How about within their first six months? Is Kendra Cole on because she's a brand new fan rep from Illinois? I do not see a Kendra. Okay, because I talked with her in the chat room earlier. All right. Um, one thing I've been working on is sort of an intro to EMSC video. Um, and if you guys don't mind, I'd, I'd like to show you that. It's about 10 minutes. Um, I think that'll take up just about the rest of our time, but I'm looking for feedback on this. Um, initially, when we developed this on the state partnership team, we thought it would be used for um, just our state partnership managers, but we realize this is really, especially this first video, we're, we're planning on doing a series is really generic and can really be geared toward fans, state partnership managers. You can probably even take this out on your road 
show. Um, it is a little rough. It's a rough draft. So bear with me on that. But after viewing it, if you can email me comments or, um, you know, type them in the chat, I'm definitely looking to fine tune this and make sure that we're where we need to be. In fact, there's already a couple of um, edits on here that you won't see on the video today, but let me see if I can share my screen. And get this plan for you. I have so many things open right now. Here it is. Okay, can everybody see that okay? All right, I'm going to play it. Welcome to the world of emergency medical services for children, otherwise known as EMSC. Whether you're just starting in your new role or are a veteran of this far reaching. If you don't have any sound, I think you have to unmute yourself for this to play. Lori, let me try that again and see if it'll work. Services for children, otherwise known as EMSC. Whether you're just starting in your new role or are a veteran of this far reaching and rewarding pediatric readiness program, you are part of a dedicated the best possible emergency care, no matter where they live, travel, or attend school throughout the United States and territories. Through this series of videos, we will introduce you to the program and assist you in navigating the many moving parts of this vast programming. Together, all branches of the EMSC program work hard to help you attain success in managing your state's program. We hope that you will find this series informative and enjoyable. For those of you new to the program, welcome to the EMSC family. We look forward to working with you. And many thanks and congratulations to our longer serving state partnership directors, managers, and coordinators for all you have done and continue to do to promote and ensure pediatric readiness in your home states and beyond. This is certainly a special group of individuals and we are fortunate to have you all on board. In order to best serve your state's program, it is best to have a working knowledge of EMSC structure and history. Throughout the series, we will learn about the different aspects of the program and offer resources and support to help guide you along the way. We would like to start with how EMSC came about and take you back to where it all began. EMSC's most notable visionary and founding father was Dr. Calvin Sia. Dr. Sia graduated Dartmouth College and completed medical school at what was then Western Reserve University. He also served in the US Army before returning to his home state of Hawaii. He completed a pediatric residency at Kauikiolani Children's Hospital and then went on to practice as a primary care pediatrician in Honolulu. Dr. Sia became a driving force in the Hawaii and national chapters of the American Academy of Pediatrics, where caring for children and educating parents and caregivers were at the forefront of his mission. During his presidency of the Hawaii Medical Association, he began to have more in-depth exposure to EMS agencies and island community hospitals that provide emergency care to children. In these days, EMS was still fairly new, having been officially recognized in the National Highway and Transportation Safety Act of 1966. He found that EMTs, paramedic, and the ambulance itself were not equipped to deal with children. He felt strongly that the first person at a child's side during illness or serious injury needed to be able to stabilize the child, provide transportation, and transfer care to a pediatric capable emergency department. He noted the needs to address the concerns of not only the children, but the parents during an emergency interaction, the need for smaller supplies and equipment, and the fact that children did not respond to cardiopulmonary resuscitation or CPR like adults do. Dr. Sia was able to leverage his leadership role with the state's medical association to interact with EMS and ask the important questions involving the care and transportation of children. Overall, he found the entire emergency system of care ill-prepared and ill-equipped to handle the needs of a child. 
Dr. Sear realized that a nationwide mindset of pediatric readiness was needed in both pre-hospital and hospital systems. He wrote a bill and presented it to the U.S. Senator from Hawaii, Daniel Inouye. Senator Inouye was on the Appropriations Committee at the time, which is the committee charged with assigning and dispersing federal monies. Both gentlemen knew they were going to need bipartisan support to make this proposal a reality. And when they reached across the aisle to U.S. Senators Orrin Hatch of Utah and Lowell Weicker of Connecticut, they found common ground. All were moved by the stories of negative experiences and outcomes in children of their own staff members in pre-hospital and hospital settings. More needed to be done to ensure pediatric readiness in EMS and emergency departments across the country. After much hard work and negotiation, Congress passed the Emergency Medical Services for Children Bill in 1984. $2 million was appropriated in 1985, and four states were able to officially begin their EMSC state partnership programs, Alabama, California, New York, and Oregon. These monies were to be used to enhance existing EMS systems and increase their ability to effectively respond to and treat pediatric emergency patients. As appropriations increased and other states saw the benefits of pediatric readiness, more and more states joined the ranks of EMSC. Some of the early pediatric transport services included Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital in Cleveland, as well as services in Atlanta, Washington, D.C., and Knoxville. Dr. Sia worked with the EMS physicians at these agencies to increase pediatric readiness in their respective states. This allowed the program and funding to continue to grow. The EMSC program is part of the Maternal and Child Health Bureau, MCHB, and Health Resources Services Administration, HRSA, also known as HRSA. MCHB dates back to 1935 when the Social Security Act authorized MCHB programs and funding. Today, the MCHB's mission is to improve the health and well being of America's mothers, children, and families. MCHB is also known for their Safe Sleep, Healthy Start, and Anti Bullying programs, to name just a few. Their programming reaches 60 million people annually. HRSA slash MCHB is also where our federal project officers and leadership reside. Today, there are 58 funded state partnership programs, including all 50 states, Washington, D.C., the U.S. territories, and two freestanding states. The EMSC program was most recently reauthorized and passed by both the U.S. House of Representatives and U.S. Senate under H.R. 776 and S. 3482, becoming public law 116-49 on August 22, 2019. This enables funding through the fiscal year 2024. The EMSC budget has grown to $20 million and monies are appropriated among several EMSC branches, all of which we will hear about in our next session. We salute Dr. Calvin Sia and Senators Inway, Hatch, and Weicker, members of Congress, and are grateful to the countless physicians, nurses, paramedics, EMTs, support staff, and state and federal employees who have worked tirelessly over the years to advocate for the appropriate and safe emergency care of pediatric patients. Sadly, we lost Dr. Calvin Sia on August 19, 2020. We would like to dedicate this first EMSC 101 video to Dr. Sia. Please take a moment to hear more about Dr. Calvin Sia and his contributions to the EMSC program. Children are unique. Children are different than the adult. Children don't speak for themselves. You have to be an advocate for them. Cal's early work to recognize the specific vulnerabilities and needs of children really set the stage for the transformation of pediatric medicine. His vision of how to care for our children, and not only here in Hawaii, you know, nationwide, uh, he has that kind of commitment. For him to have the vision that he did back in the 1960s is, you know, he was 40 years ahead of his time, quite honestly.
when I started practice, I sort of wanted to be a different guy. I sort of wanted to mold a system that would look at programs working together. I know Dr. Sia as a father of Healthy Start. We have Healthy Start workers that go into the home and basically support mom, dad, and the whole family in taking care of the child. A child is born innocent, whether the parents have wealth or don't have wealth. What's the opportunity for that child? Great for supportive services. I don't know that I've ever met a person who gets stuff done as effectively as Cal by having others do the work with them. So I looked at the community, and that's how I started Child Protect Services, Prevent Child Abuse, Home Visiting, to bring in community support to the family and myself to coordinate, communicate, and work together. Then I brought in the first emergency medical service for children and got Senator Noye to write the bill to cover the whole nation. And we got this through. And all states and territories have emergency medical service for children. This ability to be disruptive by specifically reaching across boundaries, putting families in the middle as partners in the care. When you frame it that way, it draws people in. One of the areas in the 60s nobody took care of was the so-called neurologic learning disabilities. He had seen a need for this segment of the population of children, uh, and he wanted to help them. I was able to work with the legislature and actually work with Don Ho and Land Commission <laughs> Miao and Picky Thompson and all the big boys. <laughs> and we got the land, the acre land at Friday School, and we got the building built. Whenever he met people, he always meant everything from the bottom of his heart. So you were just engaged with what his mission was and it became your mission. Health equity, no matter where you're born, should allow that child to have continuity, comprehensive, compassionate care. That's what I started and that was my dream. I um, feel that Dr. Sia's vision for that so-called medical home, which as you know, he began to articulate as early as uh, the late 1960s, it's still just as relevant today as it ever was. Um, I think our children are much better off because of his contribution to our community. Uh, I think he's taught enough people and has influenced uh, generations of folks that I feel um, his presence will always be with us. You know, if he gave me any advice, it would be as long as you can be caring and you enjoy what you do, I think that will kind of reflect into becoming the person or the, the pediatrician that you want it to be. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. <laughs> we don't have many minutes left. Does anybody have any comments or edits suggested for Victoria? I know that she's also put her email address in the chat box if you want to send her an email. Victoria, some of the font is really light on okay. there when you're reading it. That's it. I love this video. I really did. Thank yes, you. very powerful. Thank you. It is. Thank you.
All right, seeing no other comments, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this up so we can move on to our next agenda item. Um, I just, I, while we were watching the video, I wrote down some, some takeaway uh, items. Um, so I'm four years in, I'm still learning. Uh, as Vicki mentioned, and I had actually written down already, was that this is not a sprint, it's a marathon. So um, you're not gonna get a lot of immediate satisfaction, but hang in there, be patient. Um, understanding success will come um, and we're all here to support you. Um, I always feel like I can do more. Um, there's only so much time and funding that we get. So be patient with that. Um, and know that when we see other states you know, but it's also really daunting. I saw uh, Evelyn Lyons speak of the recognition program in Illinois, and I got really excited. And then I realized that she's been doing it for that, or that program's existed for 20 years. So um, really set your sights on those long goals. Um, and I think one of my big takeaways from my first experience, and hopefully your experience uh, at this all grantee meeting, is that um, EMSC supports each other. Uh, we share our resources. Um, we don't like to reinvent the wheel, you'll hear that all the time. Um, we also celebrate each other. We're all one team and that's uh, not only across the states and the associated territories, but across the NEDARC, EIC, HRSA and EMSC domain. So thank you all for joining. I will hang out for a few minutes in case you have any extra questions. Um, and thank you to Sandy and Lori and Vicki for uh, co-presenting this uh, FAN State Partnership Program Manager uh, session. Thank you all. Thanks, just everybody. Um, oh, go ahead, Hannah. I was, like a, uh, no, that's okay. Uh, a link was put in the chat uh, to redirect you back to the main landing page where you can find the agenda for the next um, session. It looks like it's going to be a networking lounge followed by Q&A with the poster authors in the poster hall. So if you have any questions, you can um, forward them to the group and enjoy the rest of your day. Um, Jen and Sandra and Lori, if you guys are interested, when we get to um, the point where we'll do more fan videos, um, I'm definitely looking for content and people to narrate. So, yeah, um, this, that video was beautiful, and we'd love to do more like this. I think that is super helpful. And I think um, we can take some excerpts from some of the sessions here to do, to, to fill in some of this. Like, Lori and Sandy gave an amazing masterclass um, yes, in, in SP fan, uh, in, in, I'm sorry, here, but also in the session before this. And maybe we can take those and um, really make something for our fans and state partners that they can view. I'd be happy to help you make a state partnership program sort of day-to-day, year-to-year um, overview for our role. Great. Yeah. The thought is, you know, we'll do a couple like generic overview videos. Um, the next one's going to be on the five different branches. And then I forget what the one after that was going to be, but then we'll really start honing in on specifics. So I would love the help and I am not at all techie or, you know, you guys know I'm not graphic arty or, you know, I, like I told you, organization is sometimes one of my pitfalls, but um, yeah, anybody that wants to help, I would greatly appreciate it. I found the, um, the interviews with live, live humans um, was really helpful to break up the animation. So I think it'd be helpful to, to have, you know, like every other minute or every few minutes have somebody speaking to kind of refocus people into paying attention. Yeah, I like that too. And unfortunately, you know, my voice just kind of drones on there for a while, but I, you know, that's what I would like too, is to at least have different voices. I know sometimes there's a lot of expense involved, I guess, in doing those interviewee type ones or time, but you know, if we can find people that can do it and can easily do it, I am all for it. <laughs> Okay, I need to hop off because I'm in the poster session here in a few minutes. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.